Hello everyone! This is going to be a special video because it's brought to you by Nerdy Tutors. I mean, all these videos come from a Nerdy Tutor, but this time I'm talking about a whole platform made just for you. Do you need some extra help with your homework, or just want to talk with somebody about a topic that makes you curious? Nerdy Tutors is an on-demand platform that connects you with the best tutor within minutes. It's mobile friendly and comes with a built-in messenger app making it easier to connect than ever before. The people working at Nerdy Tutors are experts in practically every subject, not just science, and they're always happy to help. They don't charge too much either. Follow the link in the description to find out more. Okay, let's get started with today's business. Organic chemistry is one of those topics that a lot of people struggle with. The way it's usually taught is that you are shown a bunch of things and you're just expected to memorize them. I personally love organic chemistry, but I can definitely understand this perspective. That's why this video will run through the major types of organic compounds in a more procedural way. First, I'll try to explain what an organic compound actually is, what's special about each group, and how they are related. I will also point out places where you can go and find each type of organic compound. You'd be surprised, they are absolutely everywhere. In fact, the molecules that make up your body are organic compounds, and so are the foods that keep your body running. The term organic means different things depending on what kind of scientist you ask. To a chemist, it refers to substances full of carbon atoms. Specifically, those carbon atoms are linked to other atoms by covalent bonds. What does this mean? A covalent bond consists of an even number of electrons, usually two. Those electrons come from two neighboring atoms, and they are shared equally by both atoms. The electrons, being negatively charged, are attracted to the positively charged nucleus of each atom. As you can see in this diagram, the overall attraction is equal in both directions, and it's enough to hold the atoms in place. Thus, they are bonded together. Covalent bonds are fairly strong, and each carbon atom can take part in up to four of them. For instance, one carbon atom can share electrons with four hydrogen atoms in a setup like this. We have just formed the simplest possible organic compound, methane. This substance is a gas under normal pressure and temperature conditions. It's actually a major component of that kind of gas. It is formed by biological processes such as digestion, as well as geological processes like the reaction between water and rock under the seafloor. Methane is an example of the first type of organic compound, a hydrocarbon. As the name suggests, this is a compound that's entirely made up of hydrogen and carbon. More complex hydrocarbons can be made by replacing one of those hydrogen atoms with more carbon. Two carbon atoms, each bonded to three hydrogen atoms and to each other, form ethane. This substance is also a gas under ordinary conditions, as are propane and butane, which contain three and four carbon atoms respectively. Methane, ethane, propane, and butane are all ingredients in a fuel known as natural gas. Anytime you fire up a barbecue or a gas stove, you're burning these compounds. Ugh, I'm hungry now. If we add more carbon atoms, we get longer chain-like hydrocarbons. These specific ones are usually found as liquids, and some of them, notably octane, power cars and other motor vehicles. Their specific names aren't important at this point, but I will talk about naming conventions in future videos. We can also change the nature of some of these covalent bonds. Adjacent carbon atoms are able to share two, four, or six electrons between themselves, resulting in different molecules forming. A covalent bond formed by two electrons is a single bond, as we have already seen. A covalent bond in which four electrons are involved two from each atom, is known as a double bond. It's often represented with two parallel lines. Finally, a covalent bond with six electrons, three from each atom, is a triple bond. The hydrocarbons we have seen so far only contain single bonds, 
and they are known as alkanes. Hydrocarbons containing double bonds are called alkenes. These are the molecules that form the building blocks of plastic. Hydrocarbons containing triple bonds are known as alkynes. These are less common than alkenes and release a lot more energy when they are burned. They can be found in high power applications like the ethine used in this blowtorch. In summary, hydrocarbons are organic compounds containing only hydrogen and carbon, and they are often used as fuels. Depending on the type of covalent bonding that defines them, they may be classified as alkanes, alkenes, or alkynes. I will create more detailed videos about these in the future, but for now, let's move on. The next type of organic compound is called an alcohol. Now before you ask, no, I don't drink alcohol myself. I can only speak about this stuff from a chemistry point of view. But even from this point of view, it's fairly interesting. An alcohol is an organic compound in which a hydrogen atom has been amputated and replaced with a prosthesis that looks like this. It's one oxygen and one hydrogen atom that share two electrons with each other. The oxygen is covalently bonded to the hydrogen and to the chain of carbon atoms. This is what you need to produce an alcohol. The simplest two alcohols are methanol and ethanol, which look like this. Ethanol is the key ingredient in beer, wine, and vodka that grown-ups go gaga for. Methanol is the simpler molecule that will leave you blind and or dead if you drink too much of it. As you can see, a few extra atoms make a huge difference in results. As a group, alcohols are mainly useful in the production of other organic compounds. They are important precursors for making things like detergents, preserving agents, plasticizers, and industrial solvents. They also show up in nature. The sugar molecules made by plant cells contain oxygen-hydrogen groups, which means they are technically alcohols as well. Now let's upgrade this prosthesis with some nitrogen and an extra hydrogen atom. We have created another type of organic compound called an amine. Like many organic compounds, the amines are accompanied by distinctive properties like smell. Unfortunately, their particular smell tends to remind us of urine or rotting fish. The nitrogen in an amine usually comes from ammonia, an inorganic gaseous substance. Your science teacher has probably demonstrated the smell of ammonia by leaving a jar of it open and letting it diffuse through the room, stinging the noses of everyone there with sinister glee. At least that's what my teacher did. Simple amines, such as methylamine and ethylamine, are also gases under ordinary conditions. They can easily slip into your unwary nose and deliver that unpleasant urine smell. What's important here is, not only do amines smell like we, they actually give we that smell in the first place. In other words, amines are being produced by your body right now, and many of them are destined for the toilet. All living things produce amines in their waste. Amines also show up in a lot of applications, and don't worry, they aren't made from urine anymore. Decades of research have perfected the art of combining nitrogen, carbon, and hydrogen atoms, giving us such useful things as synthetic fabrics, medicines, pesticides, dyes, and filters for gas refineries. Smaller amines are usually quite safe for humans, but some of the larger ones are well-known poisons such as the pesticide strychnine. As you can see from this diagram, the nitrogen atom in an amine can take part in three covalent bonds. Much like carbon, this gives it the ability to form chained or branching structures, which opens up a myriad of possibilities. Amines with the nitrogen situated at one end have quite different properties to those with nitrogen in the center of the molecule. That's another discussion for a future video. For now, it's time to move on to the really exciting bits. Let's go back to the alcohol molecule and inject it with an extra dose of oxygen. This produces something called a carboxylic acid, but you can just call it an organic acid if you're not feeling adventurous. What makes this harmless looking compound an acid? Well, it's capable of releasing this hydrogen atom when it's dissolved in water, which lowers the pH of the water. That is the definition of an acid. 
Before you ask, no, this is not something like hydrofluoric acid that will dissolve bone and melt through a glass tank. Carboxylic acids are much weaker than that. They're used to dissolve things slowly and gently. For example, ethanoic acid is used by paleontologists to dissolve limestone and extract any fossilized bones inside it. For something like a prehistoric turtle shell, the process only takes a year or two. That's a bargain compared to the millions of years it took to form the fossil. Much like amines, many carboxylic acids can be identified by their smell or taste, but not all of them are pleasant. Butanoic acid, for example, is infamous because it either smells like vomit or moldy cheese, depending on who you ask. Its strong odor is put to good use in fish bait. Ethanoic acid is an interesting one. It smells much like a sweaty sock, yet it actually tastes quite good. You can eat this acid, which is capable of dissolving limestone, with no ill effects at all. It's the key ingredient in vinegar. In fact, a surprising number of these acids can be found in the food we eat. Citric acid is another one. It provides the zing of citrus fruits such as lemons and oranges. I'm hungry again. When it comes to organic compounds, the greatest adventures in smell and taste come when we fuse a carboxylic acid with an alcohol. Joining them together like this produces a beast called an ester, and this is absolutely my favorite group. Take a look at this chart. Along the top we have a range of alcohols, with the simplest ones on the left. Down the side we have some carboxylic acids, with the simplest at the top. Combining each alcohol with each carboxylic acid produces... Fruit? What's this all about? A more traditional chart would give the names of the esters produced by each combination of alcohol and acid. This chart goes one step further by showing the smell of each ester. For instance, you can see that combining propanol and methanoic acid produces an ester called propyl methanoate, which smells like apples. A wide range of smells are possible, and it's the same with tastes. Food companies have been using edible esters as flavors for decades. One of my favorites is butyl butanoate, which provides the taste of a New Zealand classic candy, pineapple lumps. As you can imagine, there's a huge demand for esters and an uncountable number of products that contain them. They're not just within foods either. Polyester fabrics, fat molecules, cosmetics like nail polish, and even photographic film are all made up of esters. You can't really get away from them, because these compounds are everywhere in modern society and in nature. I've now introduced you to five major types of organic compounds. There are many other types of course, including ketones, aldehydes, and acyl chlorides, but those are more advanced and deserve close examination in later videos. For now, studying these groups will be enough to get you started with organic chemistry. If you look closely at these compounds, you will learn to recognize patterns and processes that explain everything, from the burning of hydrocarbons to the life of every cell in your body. I'd like to thank the sponsor of this video, Nerdy Tutors. If you have questions about organic chemistry you'd like answers for right now, follow the link below to connect with the tutor in minutes. And thank you for watching. Please consider subscribing to my channel so you don't miss the next video, or leave your questions and requests in the comment section. Until next time, good luck with your studies.